Hi, my name is Dwayne Gathers, and welcome to Civitas LA, featuring diverse and emerging leaders who make up this dynamic region and are creating community every day and building a better tomorrow. These bi-weekly conversations enable us to hear from, learn from, and be inspired by a new generation of civic entrepreneurs who are forging a path forward in making our region a stronger, more resilient, and connected group of citizens. Now more than ever, we aim to elevate civic discourse, foster community connections, and promote civic knowledge and engagement across our region while elevating diverse and emerging voices in that conversation. While we think of the great migration of the 1920s that saw major populations of the Black South move to northern cities such as Detroit, Chicago, and New York, prior to that, between the 1890s and 1910, large groups of black Americans migrated to Los Angeles, primarily from Texas, Shreveport, New Orleans, and Atlanta, to escape racial violence and bigotry of the South. Then, with the second Great Migration in the 1940s, fueled by LA's post-World War II economy with substantial job opportunities in the defense sectors, LA's black population exploded from roughly 63,500 in 1940 to over 750,000 in 1970. So as we mark Black History Month, Civitas LA celebrates the significant contributions African Americans have made and continue to make towards our region's economic, social, and cultural landscape. We give thanks and honor those who've gone before us. We on this podcast celebrate and elevate the dynamic leaders who are moving our region forward. And as we celebrate Black History Month 2022, I want to give a special thanks to our friends at Community Build for sponsoring this series this month. Last year, um, June of 2022 to be exact, McKinsey Global Institute issued a report entitled The Economic State of Black America, What Is and What Could Be. In that report, it noted, and I quote, closing racial gaps across the economy is not only about righting historical wrongs, it is also about choosing a more dynamic future and realizing the full potential of a massively unutilized source of talent to the benefit of all Americans. In thinking about the role that financial institutions have played or should play in nurturing, fostering, and ensuring financial inclusion of our urban communities and how we can collectively work to realize that more dynamic future for all, I am delighted to be joined in studio today by two dynamic community leaders, Karen A. Clark, Senior Vice President of Multicultural Strategies and Business Development, and Jasmine Willis, Vice President, Crenshaw Branch for City National Bank, our region's leading homegrown financial institution now part of Royal Bank of Canada, as they share perspectives on these challenges and opportunities, but also how City National's approach to investing in diverse communities may offer a way forward, or as they might say, the way up, for others to follow suit in meeting the needs of our ever-evolving communities. Karen and Jasmine, as we celebrate Black History Month 2022, welcome to Civitas LA. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Great. Glad to have you both here. You know, on Civitas LA, we love for our guests to give us a self-introduction. So with that, Jasmine, tell us about Jasmine Willis. Give us a short intro. All right. Well, again, thank you for having us here. Um, It's a great opportunity. Um, My family is originally from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so grew up mostly here in Los Angeles. And, you know, I've got a chance to see the best of both worlds coming from the South and having migrated here to Los Angeles. So, you know, being able to kind of see the economic structure of Louisiana and, you know, how having a predominantly kind of black community um, has kind of helped shape my interest in wanting to sort of develop what is here in Los Angeles and kind of nurture that. Um, you know, as a child, I didn't really see much diversity. You know, you kind of just seen the the Latin community and then you seen the black community. Um, as I've gotten older and had more experience and exposure to, uh, let's say, other communities, um, my heart has always been nurtured in Los Angeles. So, you know, I, I keep that embedded in me. And, you know, it's a passion of mine to really serve in my community. When did your family migrate from Louisiana to Los Angeles? So in the early 90s. Early 90s, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Excellent. Karen A., as they call you, Karen A.? Yes, they do call me Karen A. because if you just 
look up Karen Clark, you'll get 10 million of it. <laughs> For some reason, none of the other ones use A. <laughs> and that is my middle initial, Anne. My Catholic confirmation name, I grew up as a Catholic child, Air Force brat. Both my parents were in the Air Force, and we did a lot of traveling, but um, we loved it. And what I got to see was a lot of diversity, even though... I didn't necessarily, you know, when we lived on Air Force bases, it wasn't a lot of, you know, diversity in the class, my classrooms and that sort of thing. But traveling, because my, my family, my dad was from Oklahoma, and um, I got to see all sides of, you know, how folks lived, you know, from very, very poor to coming to L.A. in the summertime sometimes, and, you know, with aunts who were, you know, hip and swinging, you know, with their apartments and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. But um, so I grew up, you know, just traveling, loving to travel, went to college um, as a way of making sure I, I said I either go to the Air Force or go to college. If I get into college, cool, great. It'll be a way of getting, you know, up and out of here and seeing the world, continuing to see the world. If I don't, I'll go to the Air Force. I got into college. I struggled, worked my way through, got financial aid. But let me tell you, I hustled, loved it, you know taught me all kinds of entrepreneurial skills and I got into the arts and so I got married had both kids prior to prior to leaving college he was from LA that's how I got to LA okay Mm -hmm. and went to went to a headhunter and that's how I ended up at Wells Fargo Bank but never gave up the arts so for I think um, yeah I think probably out of the 55 this is episode 56 this is probably our first where we're Meeting, we're including you know folks from the financial services community, and I want to think that both of you collectively um, represent probably half a century of work in the financial services sector. So you know, share with us you know how you got to the financial services sector and your personal journeys in the financial services world here in Los Angeles. Karen, start with you. Well, so I, I was uh, in a play actually in Sacramento where I, where I went to school. At Cal State U Sacramento, where I met my late husband, who was going to school on his GI Bill. And anyway, he got a job in an indie film company here in LA, got our kids who were at that time probably three and four, two or three years old, packed up the U Haul and came to LA. <laughs> and a month later, I followed when the production was over, started auditioning. I had no agent, which you desperately need in LA, but I did have a degree in economics. And so okay. I said, well, let me go get you know a job. And I went to a headhunter and she called and she said, I have an interview at Wells Fargo Bank. And I said, I don't want to be a teller. That's all I knew about banking. Okay. And you know, nothing against tellers, but all my friends in college were tellers and they flunked. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody, you know, passed that assignment. And I said, I don't want to do that. And she said, it's in commercial real estate. And I said, what do banks do with commercial real estate? I ended up in construction lending. And it was a wild, wonderful ride. And Wells Fargo Bank, I actually was hired as an admin assistant, and things were moving so quickly in the 80s with, you know, um, construction lending, big, you know, hotels and huge um, tract home projects. And so I learned from the administrators, you know, how to do loan documentation. And next thing you know, I'm in a, you know, conference room with credit officers and, you know, and learning and understanding negotiation. And, um, and so within a year, I was hired as an as a loan uh, credit okay. as a loan admin officer, you know, recruited to be a VA, got my first management assignment, and ended up. This is what was so fun um, when real estate just crashed again in the early '90s, um, and um, and uh, Bank of America got purchased Security Pacific Bank. Oh, right. And I ended up on the quote-unquote bad bank team. They took all the you know, commercial <laughs> real estate assets and they divided them into good bank, bad bank. And I ended up <clears throat> uh, managing $7 billion worth of non-performing assets in the Western region. And it was just so much, so much fun because you learned all kinds of things, you know, what not to do in crafting real estate <laughs> Mm-hmm. Excellent. <laughs> that okay. led to corporate diversity uh, when we hit our five-year plan in three. And, you know, corporate diversity, it was a whole other international wild ride with B of A and then nonprofit ride and then U.S. Bank. And here I am at City National. There you go. So, you know, again, we're not going to discuss age, but I think you've got more years in the industry than Jasmine here. So, <laughs> Jasmine, share with, share, with your, share, with, share with us your journey into financial services and how that's evolved over time. I've been in the financial industry for going on 14 years now. Um, you know, when I when I first got hired at Washington Mutual back in 2008, oh, wow. yes, wow. Okay. <laughs> started off as a teller. Um, I was recruited by one of um, the assistant managers at my local branch, 
And, you know, I had no interest in banking. I had no idea what the role of a teller was beside cashing checks. And at the time, Washington Mutual had these kind of special, what they called at the time, Ocasio branches, where it was kind of more face to face. There wasn't this bullet resistant glass that was, you know, in front of you and, and the customer. But, um, you know, I really liked the concept. And, you know, I was told you can, quote unquote, do big things in banking. Mm-hmm. Um, so I left my then job at Ikea, um, which was in retail, to go into banking. And again, with no prior banking experience, I learned quickly. I was fortunate enough to have good leaders um, that nurtured me as a teller and very quickly promoted within five months to become a personal banker. Okay. Um, at that time, my branch was very diverse. Um, and, and also the community we were in was also, it, we mirrored our, our residents there in the community. Um, so, you know, having seen that, having seen the opportunities of growth and development within banking, I knew my next step was to go into leadership. And at the time, I didn't see any leaders that looked like me. I didn't see any black women in leadership. And I knew it was important to change that. Um, so continuing to be nurtured and developed by those that were before me, um, and, you know, just really remaining authentic. I think that was the most important thing that I learned in banking was to be authentic, Mm -hmm. not to try to confine into this mold of what a quote unquote branch manager or bank leader should be, but to still be me, bring my authentic personality and also at the same time, just come in with a servant's heart to help out mm-hmm. those that are in need. Um, I realized growing up, I had no financial guidance in a sense. I mean, you know, your parents tell you, oh, save your piggy bank. Right. Uh, if you get a credit card, don't use it. Don't get credit cards. But, you know, I realized that that's, that's not the type of leadership or the type of coaching we should be giving, um, especially those in our community. They need to know these things early on. Yeah. Well, you, you touched on something about the mentorship that you had and you've had along the way. And I and I noted there was a, an, another report that I, I saw last year which talked about the issue of, of, of racial and gender equity in financial services. And, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a difficult report to read. Um, and they talked about specifically, um, you know, the experiences of Asian, black, and Latinx women in financial services. You know, what's been your perspective on... Um, on your journeys and the mentorship that you've had along the way to enable you to grow in your particular roles. Karen? Well, I'm going to tell you, Dwayne, I have been very fortunate um, with mentorship and without it, you as a female, especially a female of color, you are not really going to get the opportunities. Um, I mean, you know, Let's, we can look at the numbers and see people of color in general don't. But the thing that makes the difference is the mentorship and the sponsorship because you need the visibility. There's no question about the experiences. I mean, you go into it with the proper degrees and you build your experiences like everybody else, right? What's missing is the visibility and the deeper experiences that you get from that sponsorship. And I've been so fortunate because I started off in an all-male world you know, older males at that in many, many cases in those conference rooms with the lawyers and the development officers and, you know, the development companies and the, you know, credit officers and me being often one of the only female, usually the only female of color if there were two or three more. And so I learned quickly being, you know, in that fire and as my career progressed, I understood the importance of having mentorship from white males in power, but also somebody of color who had been through that fire, right? You need more than one. You need two, and if you can get three or four, and then I have to know you're, you're, you, they are your mentor. You grab on and you learn, and you build the relationships that you need so that people you know, will help you. Mm-hmm. And certainly, you know, City National Bank, you know, homegrown institution, you know, just, you know, such a storied um, institution here in in our region. Um, How did you land at City National Bank and what's been your experience at the bank with regards to mentorship to enable you to do your work? So share with us how you got to City National Bank and your role at the bank. Jasmine? Sure thing. So um, I was told about the Crenshaw District branch manager opening while I was still at Chase. 
Um, I was a branch manager at Chase uh, right across from USC, um, and which we considered a community branch as well um, because we did serve that that area um, in conjunction with our Crenshaw branch, our Crenshaw Chase branch, um, because we were in the same district. So we did a lot of community community involvement projects together. Um, I wasn't aware of City National's presence on Crenshaw until I was made aware about the branch manager opening. And immediately when I was told about City National's efforts in terms of um, reinvesting in the community and community engage engagement and involvement, I knew this was something I had to take part of. I was comfortable at Chase. Um, you know, I had developed a lot of relationships there, um, but I knew this was an opportunity that I could not pass up. So after 13 years of being at, you know, Washington Mutual and Chase collectively, I decided to take that leap at City National. And, you know, one of the people that I met during um, kind of like my interview process was Karen A. Okay. And when I saw her, I was like, I have to be there. <laughs> okay. So she was the mentor. So that 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 that's a great segue, and I'm going to have Karen a answer this because I know it was really you know again knowing my knowledge of City National Bank as one that serves high net worth individuals, a lot of entertainment um, exposure, et cetera. Um, you know, it was sort of a, a, a new thing for many of us in the economic development space to hear of City National Bank's investment, um, you know, in this community. And and I know it was in 2017 where. Um, the former chairman and CEO um, of, of the bank noted, as part of our growing commitment to Los Angeles and our expanding resources, we look forward to opening this new office in the heart of LA's historic and vibrant Crenshaw neighborhood. So Karen, you were there at, during this process. Can you share any, any insights as how this all evolved and how this led to this de decision? I can. So our former chairman, just having retired January 31st of this year, Russell Goldsmith created my position. And uh, actually, when I came to City National Bank in 2011, Russell um, um, was the person who I you know, really worked with to understand what was the vision for my job, which is multicultural strategies and business development. And, um, and he was a mentor. And I had a lot of other mentors, including the then only three female executives on the executive committee. Oh, now, as you know, Kelly Coffey is our CEO. She's been there three years. And we've got um, a huge increase of females on the executive committee. So yeah. that female mentorship through Kelly and those that she started appointing, in addition to the three that they were there, have made a huge difference in the visibility of women. And mm -hmm. so now, you know, great. Representation matters. Sure. Um, but... <clears throat> In 2015, when the Royal Bank of Canada and City National Bank came together, um, we uh, decided that we wanted to, because Royal Bank of Canada has, you know, um, um, a lot more assets, there were a lot of divisions that we were able to do a lot more with, such as expand our capital markets capability, but community is very important to RBC as well. Okay. And diversity is very important to RBC as well, extremely important. In fact, I would say that RBC is one of the global leaders in corporate diversity, and they think that community, that youth, is vital to the business model because they feel there's a corporate responsibility. And so having their assets and having this, you know, much bigger company behind us gave us an opportunity to accelerate what we you know had been doing in CRA and mm -hmm. so my division multicultural strategies and partnership with Sam Mendoza CRA Jennifer Nickerson and the community department um, we were able to um, help Russell Goldsmith and I give him all the credit for really only in a six month period saying we're going to put a branch in that district it is going to be our first branch in a majority minority community mm -hmm. in a district that has um, not only affluent and high net worth but ha and not only median but has low low income and we put all of our you know efforts together and I was able to lead the first integrated marketing plan to address the needs of the community from a marketing from a sponsorship from a service side and we came together in a collaborative effort mm -hmm. and built a branch that served the needs of the vast 
and diverse community that is Crenshaw and hit our four-year goal in one year, which goes to once again prove the business case for diversity when you put equity in place. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, you know, as we have so many alternative financial organizations to traditional banks, and as a lot of financial um, services are now going online, it was unique to be going in with brick and mortar um, facility into a community. What were some of the internal concerns, if any, that were raised along the way? And what were some of the unique opportunities that the bank leadership assessed in making that decision? Well, one of the concerns was that we were known as the Bank of the Stars, Mm -hmm. the, you know, high net worth bank that was our business model. Mm -hmm. And so how then are you going to address the needs of people in the district that don't fit that model? Sure. And so, again, that's where the collaborative efforts come together. And even though we didn't have a physical presence in Crenshaw, we had years and years of partnership with all of the community organizations in the district, adjacent to the district, Mm -hmm. in L.A. County, in L.A. region. And so we, you know, that was authentic to us. Our community service, we over-index City National on employee community service, and we do more than what our CRA obligation is. So we already had all the partnerships in place so that when we put that brick and mortar in place, it was a matter of then just inviting our partnerships into that branch to make sure that we were continuing to serve those low to mod income clients through those partnerships, but now they could show up at a physical branch. And that's how we address those needs. So it was a concern of the bank, but when I put together and when when our collaborative team put together that integrated marketing plan, we solved for that issue, which is also authentic to to City National Bank. We're a consultative bank. Sure, sure, sure. We like to solve problems Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for our clients. Mm -hmm. And what's been the response uh, and the welcome by the community and you know, Jasmine, since you're leading the branch now, you know, I'm sure you can share any numbers. But what's been, what have been some of the results um, of the branch since it's been opened? You know, a lot of the verbal feedback that we get is our clients love that relationship aspect that we offer. You're not just simply coming in to open an account or, you know, to apply for a mortgage loan or a business loan. You're coming in to develop a relationship with your account officer, your banker, your branch manager that you can consult with directly as opposed to, We're not going to send you to call a customer service line when you have a need or a concern. You're going to call us directly on our personal cell phones. You're going to be able to engage with us, which is something that a lot of the bigger retail banks and having come from that space previously, um, you know, a lot of the retail banks, that's how they get these multitudes of clients because they don't have direct interactions with them. But at City National and more specifically at the Crenshaw District branch, we pride ourselves on that relationship building. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're physically out in the community showing face. um, And, you know, the response has been tremendous. And it's, you know, it's 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 amazing having come from that retail banking space and now being at the Crenshaw District branch. um, You know, it, it was one of the best decisions I made because I truly see the abundance of welcome the community has for us. So are you going to give us your cell phone that we can put on the air for listeners? <laughs> you know, Karen A. Clark Woo! is not scared. Karen A. Clark is not scared Listen. Yeah, okay. no, no, because I'm going to tell you something. This has been my experience, and I do it all the time. I do it in my financial ed classes. I do it sent over the pandemic on Zoom. I have given my number. And there is always only a very small percentage of people who are going to follow up. Uh, I don't know why that is. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, Jasmine, you touched on the response um, by the community quite favorably to to your presence in the community. And we've been fortunate to have a a number of community conversations with civic leaders on Civitas L.A., you know, exploring all that is happening across South L.A., and particularly the Crenshaw area, and more particularly the Lamert Park area, and you guys are not far from there. So, you know, we've highlighted leaders across South L.A. We had a community spotlight, Lamert Park. You know, from where you sit, how do you view the state of economic activity and opportunity um, in the community? The development is amazing. You know, I know a lot of it may appear optically that, you know, there's gentrification going on or, you yeah, know, that, they're that, trying that, to. And I was going to say that, that, that's, <laughs> that's been hit on a, a lot as a result of, you know, the Metro line opening yes. soon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So go ahead. 
Yeah, and I, I think anytime there's change to what currently exists, you're gonna you're gonna have both positive and negative responses. The upside I see to what's going on is that this is gonna create spaces for more community residents to become involved, uh, excuse me, involved with mm-hmm. new jobs. They're going to open new businesses. Jobs mm-hmm. are going to expand. Um, look at Doolin Soul Food on Crenshaw. Um, his project expansion is, of course, going to allow for him to hold more events and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to be able to employ more community um, residents to work at his restaurants and his food trucks. Right. So I think the expansion is, is you know, it's going to take some time, but I think at some point the community is going to realize that it's for the betterment of the community and its residents. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Karen, I know when we talked about this episode opportunity some time ago, you know, you know, we talked about the role that banks have played or have not have, have, have played in investing in or disinvesting from communities. But you also talked about, you know, the role of individuals and 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 how they can better position themselves in 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 elevating and securing that relationship with institutions so that there are better outcomes for the individuals share share some thoughts on that please well, thanks for asking that Dwayne because <clears throat> i think that the huge opportunity in the Crenshaw district and in every district across the country that is being impacted in any way by whatever you want to call gentrification or any other civic issues, the opportunity is participation. Participation with your financial institution. And that's why I said, I'm not scared to give out a cell phone number. That is how we were able to help our clients during the pandemic and during the PPP loan. City National clients called their relationship manager on their cell phone if they didn't pick up their office number and they were able to get a PPP application as opposed to going to an 800 number or online. So we're not scared to give our number. That's how we do business. And that is how individuals need to participate with their bank. They need a relationship. And you don't have to jump to City National at your bank. You need to find out who is your relationship manager because if you can't find out out who's your small business officer, you don't have a relationship. If you have to go to an 800 number, you don't have a relationship. If you can't get a hold of your councilman's office, you don't have a relationship. If you can't get a hold of, you know, the 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 new business owner that's going into, you know, the storefront mm-hmm. to find out, you know, what is their community engagement and what are they selling and you're not participating. That's the huge opportunity. We mm-hmm. all as individuals have to participate and have relationships in order to have the community that we want. Mm-hmm. And that's why Jasmine said we show up. We're not just a branch on Crenshaw. We go to neighborhood association meetings and, you know, we go to, you know, block parties. <laughs> and we, You know, you got a party in the garage, you know, uh, and the door is open. You got enough space. You know, I'll come sing. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, I, yeah, that, I told that, you that, I never that, gave up the arts. That, that, yeah. that, that, but, that, that is an advocation of yours, which we can talk about. That, that's another episode. <laughs> but we have to participate. We all do. Yes. That is how we, we, we get the community we want. Mm-hmm. And Jasmine, so how do you see, you know, in, in the post-pandemic environment, how do you see the relationship between the bank and the Crenshaw District um, evolving over the next couple of years? You know, one thing about Crenshaw is that there is always something happening. I know the pandemic has hindered in-person events, um, like the Taste of Soul, for example. You know, that was a big Crenshaw staple that I've been going to for years. And, you know, I know eventually it's going to go back to an in-person live setup. But, um, you know, I think once the the pandemic sort of subsides, if ever, you know, I think once it becomes a little bit more safe for um, you know, the district residents to, to go outside, um, I definitely foresee that there'll be a lot more live in person. You have jazz music on the corners of Lamert. Uh, you have food trucks. You're going to have a lot of vendors. Um, you know, I think it's going to create a lot of opportunities for businesses to flourish and develop. And, you know, City National is going to be present. Mm-hmm. Well, certainly, you know, thinking about how we've all navigated the pandemic and how you know, the bank has navigated the pandemic. You know, I noted uh, a really interesting statement by the CEO of the, of the bank in your corporate social responsibility report. And I think, um, you know, Kelly Coffey mentioned that, you know, we are here to serve others when it matters most. 
Yes. That was mm-hmm. that was that was a great statement. Can yes. You? And the thing about City National Bank, as I said, we over index on employees engaging themselves in the community. We just love to volunteer. Now I will tell you a lot of banks have employees that volunteer. That's the good thing about banks that a lot of people don't see. And City National is one of those. And we're a small, little teeny bank. But let me tell you something. We punch way above our weight. And we just recently started telling our story after, you know, 60, 65 years. And we we have shown up with financial education, with literacy we have shown up very personally with small, you know, community organizations. We don't have billions of dollars. We don't have, you know, the foundations that the banks with trillions of dollars do. But we are there. Well, with that, with that said, you know, um, were there or are there proposed any new product, services, or initiatives that you all will be rolling out over the over the coming months or years? And and do you do you foresee, um, you know? the bank looking at other communities in 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 South LA or the diverse communities in the region to open new locations to open new locations you know it's that's hard to say because of you know what's going on with the world in the terms of pandemic mm-hmm. and banks in general have been pulling back on brick and mortar but with that said we did open um, a branch in Atlanta over the pandemic okay. a new branch in Atlanta we opened up a new branch in New York and we opened up uh, a third location over the pandemic. It'll right. come to me in a moment. Miami? But yeah, we have been expanding. We do. We opened up Miami, I think, just before okay. the pandemic. But we've been expanding, um, and we typically lead with entertainment and then build, mm-hmm. you know, a commercial bank around it. So, um, but but I tell you, I sit in marketing, product, and digital. I report to the to the CMO, to the chief marketing officer. And we are rapidly becoming a hands-on relationship bank with digitally enabled clients. Um, And so we're really trying to balance and meet clients where they are and where they want to be. Um, But City National Bank has never had a huge branch distribution model Mm -hmm. because we are so relationship driven. Well, you know, this has been great. You know, we appreciate, um, you know, your leadership um, in community, obviously your leadership in the financial services industry. um, And we look forward to, you know, following your progress at City National Bank. As we like to do in our Civitas LA episode, we'd like to wind down with um, a little bit of a lightning round where we get get, get a sense of you and your Los Angeles when you're not out there serving community um, as bankers. So are you ready for our lightning round? I mean, I'm yes. not that fast, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> okay, we're gonna okay. try it. <laughs> okay, and 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 Jasmine, since you're um, handling the Crenshaw area, you don't have to make it limited to to Crenshaw, but you can if you'd like. Give us a favorite restaurant, Jasmine, or two. Okay, so. Since I was young, it has been Harold and Bell's. Okay. Harold and Bell's <laughs> yes. is a staple, has always been. My parents took me there when I was younger. Um, and then when I want something quick, kind of more on the fast food spectrum, uh, Hotville Chicken. That has become oh. my new favorite. Okay, where? Uh, so it's right behind the Crenshaw Mall. Um, and it's it's owned by uh, Greg Doolin. Um, but stems from the uh, Price family in Nashville. Okay. So that, yeah, that authenticity that is there. Mm-hmm. Karen A., favorite restaurant or two? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, right before the pandemic, I went to Ben's Chili Bowl, and they have Ooh. become one of my <laughs> new you. favorites. Okay. And um, so that's one. And <laughs> I, I'm just going to say, I'm going to say Doolin's. I mean, there's so many in L.A. I'm okay. going to go with Doolin's. I love so many, though. I mean, listen, let me tell you. Okay. Favorite place to take a sip? Coffee, watering hole? Okay. So, coffee recently fell in love with Hilltop. Hilltop, okay. Uh, Hilltop is pretty good. Um, and then take a sip of a libation. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to mention one if uh, you don't want. Well, I'm not going to limit it to L.A., but one of my favorite places is St. and Second in Long Beach. Um, okay. They have really good craft cocktails. We 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 are supporting the greater Los Angeles yes. region, so <laughs> it can be it can be outside of the city of L.A. Karen A., favorite place to take a sip? 
My favorite place to take a sip is at a jazz festival Ooh, okay. <laughs> or on the beach on vacation, which I am going on soon. Okay. And um, been a long time. Okay. Well, it's only been since July. But okay. <laughs> well deserved. Like <laughs> Ten years. Favorite place to take a visitor. Okay, so um, hmm. That is a great question. I feel like you you always have to go to the beaches. Um, when whenever I have a visitor that comes from out of town, I always take them to like the historic stuff. So Watts Towers is Watts still Tower. one okay. of the favorite places. Great, Karen A. Favorite place to take a visitor? Uh, down Sunset, uh, to the beach, um, and Vibratos. Oh, uh, in Bel Air. Gotcha. That's actually my favorite place to take a sip. Now that I think about it. Okay. Oh, you gotta take me. <laughs> we we love our outdoor space here in Los Angeles. Give us a favorite park or favorite hike, Karen A. Oh, favorite hike. Um, I never know the name of them. Oh, but I'll tell you, Kennethon Park. There Real you go. locally, yes. There you go. Yep. I, I agree with that. Kennethon Park is one of my favorites. Okay. You know, you mentioned that as bankers community leaders you're out and about a lot so give us a favorite community activity or event taste of soul hands down taste of soul can't okay. wait for it to come back karen long beach jazz festival okay long beach jazz. that's that's the first mention for that karen and jasmine this has been great you know we thank you for joining us today and sharing your perspectives on this challenging topic but also discussing your work at city national bank and city national bank's unique approach to serving and investing in diverse communities as we say on civitas la the guest gets the final word. So give us a concluding thought or any calls to action, or what advice would you have for other black women considering entering the financial services arena? Jasmine. Hmm. So my call to action would be to establish a relationship with the financial institution. Take advantage of any financial literacy that you can obtain. Wealth is, or knowledge is wealth. Knowledge is wealth. And I would say to all female black women out there, don't be afraid to take a stand. Don't be afraid. Get out of your comfort zone and get into it. Excellent. Thank you. Karen A., thank you for being here. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Be curious. And when it comes to financial education, there is information everywhere. But um, yes, my phone number is and it, I work from home, 213-344-9009. And I will tell you something. I will direct you to any information you need, home buying, income property, um, banking. I will direct you where you need to go because you need to be empowered. And there is no reason why you cannot understand how everything in this world is connected to you financially. Um, I teach kids, Bill Duke. I'm, I'm the financial ed director for Bill Duke fin uh, Foundation. Oh, wow. And those... Okay. High school kids walk out of there knowing how to listen and ask any question that they need to to feel empowered financially. It is not that hard. Excellent. We will help you. Jasmine, Karen, thank you so much. This dialogue has been great, and we appreciate your time and your appreciate your service to the community. Thank you for joining us today. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this program, and we hope you join us in two weeks as we continue our celebration of Black History Month where we have the opportunity to sit with Dr. David Carlisle of Charles Drew University. Civitas LA extends again a special thank you to our friends at Community Build for the generous support of this series and their support of our work. To learn more about the work of Community Build, please visit www.communitybuildinc.org. And until we meet again, we invite you to stay strong and get involved. To learn more about Civitas LA and to share feedback on this program or recommend a future program, please visit us at www.civitasla.com. And don't forget to connect with us on Facebook at Civitas LA, on Instagram at Civitas underscore LA, and on Twitter at Civitas underscore LA. Mm -hmm.